Hi everybody, I'm Craig Lieberman, original owner of the Fast and Furious Supra, the Skyline from Too Fast, Too Furious, and the Maxima from the first movie as well. I was technical advisor on the first two movies, and today I want to talk to you about a topic that I get asked about a lot. It's the Eclipse. The Eclipse is one of the most loved cars in the franchise. It's also one of the most replicated with an estimated 50 replicas now floating around the world. I talk about this car in my book a little bit, but it's one of the, still one of the most asked about cars. You'd think the information would be readily available online, but I've done tons of research myself, and I found that most of what you're going to find online is just simply wrong. So putting together my notes and using the notes I had from the book, and after numerous recent conversations with the owner, John Lapid, it's time to set the record straight about this car. So let's dig in. First, it's important to understand that we're talking about the Hero car, which is the original car having been owned by John Lapid. John Lapid's 1996 Eclipse RS started off forest green and then was painted silver. John showed up with this car in its silver color at one of my casting calls for the movie way back in early 2000. Since his Eclipse was the only one that showed up, his car got cast because we were absolutely looking for an Eclipse for that role. The movie portrayed the car as being some high-power tuner car capable of running with cars like Dom's RX-7 but nothing could be further from the truth. John's Eclipse was an RS, which meant it was a non-turbo, two-liter, four-cylinder, rated at 145 horsepower. The car had some basic bolt-on mods, and that was about it. At best, the car made about 150 horsepower. The nitrous kit you saw in the movie was actually fake. It was never hooked up. That doesn't matter, though, as this car would have been a high 14 or a low 15 second car in the best case scenario. With street tires and street suspension, it might not even have done that. The body kit was by Robocar and it was really a ripoff of the Blitz kit for that car. At the time, John had put some really nice 19 inch ADR M classic wheels on the car and the way John had it, it was a really nice looking car. The interior is representative of cars of that era. Sparco seats and a steering wheel, some carbon fiber overlays, a couple of custom gauge panels and a custom built roll cage was added. Accessories included goodies from Foliatech like a shift knob, pedal covers and a sound system by so Stoney. Again, it was pretty typical of show cars at the time. The brakes and suspension received a few simple tweaks like cross-drilled rotors, sway bars, Tanabi adjustable suspension, fake disc covers for the rear drum brakes, and the obligatory underbody neon lighting. This was not a race car, but in the movie, the producers sure do make it seem that way, right? So what did they get wrong? For starters, a three-stage nitrous kit wouldn't have been used on a stock motor. Such systems are usually for dedicated big engine race cars or big turbo cars. Stage 1 in that case might be for building boost, stage 2 might be for mid-track after the car has settled, and stage 3 might be for a high boost race gas setting. The stages refer to how much nitrous is being delivered at any setting. In a 15 second car you certainly don't need three stages of nitrous, not on a stock motor. The stock motor would grenade in anything more than say 75 to 100 horsepower anyway, so it's academic. Second, since this car was not a turbo and not an all-wheel drive model, all the nitrous in the world wouldn't have helped this car go much faster. Moving on to other elements of the sequence, we are greeted with the famous danger to manifold bit. I argued against this, of course, pointing out the absurdity of that phrase. I made a few suggestions as to how they could convey a sense of danger to the engine's health simply by showing something like a low oil pressure light, a temperature gauge sweeping into the red, or by displaying a message on the laptop that said something like over boost warning. Nope. All that got shot down in favor of a more simple message that non-car people could understand. Next was the notion of the floorboard falling out. I argued that Vin Diesel's feet would be dangling from the car, Fred Flintstone style, when Brian rescued him. I lost that argument too. The production team wanted to see fire and sparks in this scene. I presented alternatives that were more realistic, but these two were shot down. As an advisor, I only had so much influence. At the end of the scene, there's talk about fried piston rings, yet the car still managed to limp back to the starting line. A bit improbable, but whatever. But driving the car after that, like nothing happened, is highly unlikely. Fortunately, the car is killed properly, and finally, when Johnny Tran fills it full of lead in the scene of just a few minutes later. One part of the scene that never sat right with many people was when the car blew up. When the car did blow up, Dom screams this word NOS as if it's flammable or explosive. That's not the case. It's combustible, but only under certain conditions. Blowing up the car was a fun bit and was absolutely thrilling to watch them do it. To pull this off, they gutted the car and removed the drivetrain. They built a large canister inside the car, carefully placed it on the car's center of gravity, and a hole was cut in the floor to funnel the blast downward. Doors were attached with cable stays to prevent them flying off, and the windows were tinted black so you couldn't see the gutted interior. When the chemical mixture is ignited, it produces thrust to move the car up, and the color of the flames can be manipulated by this mixture. It was a fitting end to this car. 
So you may be saying to yourself, why do we blow up a perfectly good eclipse? Actually, this car was not exactly a perfectly good eclipse. In fact, we had six eclipses to film this movie. Hero One was the car owned by John Lapid. It's used for the establishing shots when the car pulls up, when uh, the car pulls up over at Farmer's Market scene and there's a discussion between uh, uh, ja Rule and, and, and Paul Walker and they're looking under the hood of the car, that would be the Hero car. Hero 2 is the car used for interior shots. The interior shots would be things like scrolling across the gauges with the camera, that kind of thing. What's interesting about the Hero 2 car is after the movie, the car was sold to George Barris. If, for those of you who don't know, George Barris was a guy who did the original Batmobile from the 1960s and a few other cars like the Munsters cars, all this probably before your time, but he had somewhat of a reputation in the business. This car that was sold to George Barris, uh, the car was eventually sold to a buyer in the Netherlands, the same person who owns my Supra, my old Supra. What people don't know is Barris funkified the hell out of this car's interior and it stands today as a tribute to Barris's cluelessness in the tuner industry. Just look at the picture. Stunt one, this was the exploded car. The exploded car was resurrected and is now sitting in a, in a museum in Las Vegas, Nevada, and it sits pretty much the way it was after we put the fire out. So it's pretty cool if you ever get a chance to see it. Stunt two, this car was actually repainted blue and refitted with a Bomex kit for Too Fast to Furious. I was tasked with redoing some of the cars from the first movie to reuse in the second movie. So we painted over them. We had to change the body kits, change the wheels and all that sort of thing. So this was one of the cars. Stunt number three, was repainted candy red and the same thing, a Bomex body kit, different wheels, different exhaust and reused in uh, Too Fast, Too Furious. That car is now in, a, in Rusty's Museum in Tennessee. The Buck car, the car that we would have used for mounting on a gimbal to do action shots, uh, the whereabouts of that car are unknown. The Mick Rig car, the car that was cut up and used for the sequence where uh, Brian is running from the cops with Dom in his front seat. Uh, the whereabouts of that buck are unknown. Presumably Dennis McCarthy still has the car. So let's also talk about one of the topics that uh, people approach me about every week. I get probably 10 emails a day about this. People want to talk about building replicas. Hey Craig, can you help me out to build a replica? Can you give me a parts list and all that other kind of stuff? So let's talk about building replicas for just a second. While it's a great idea, there's something you need to consider. Many of the companies who made these parts are long, long since out of business or the parts have long been since discontinued. Essentially, this means that your only option is to buy the parts that exist for these cars and are already out there in the marketplace, but nearly all of them are being used on existing replicas. Builders of these existing replicas have spent thousands of hours researching the right part numbers and scouring the internet globally for available parts. Don't expect anyone to give you the full list of parts and part numbers. It's not going to happen. Why? Because many of these people are still trying to find some of these parts for themselves. It's also worth noting that this car wouldn't be cheap to build. Figure 6,000 for the car, then you add headlights, body kit, wheels, which are impossible to find, tires, the old st stereo components from 1999, which you can only find them used, they're discontinued, seats that are discontinued, doing a proper paint job and molding the body kit on the car, the interior fabrication work, making a custom roll cage, which is not an easy task, um, a proper suspension kit to mimic what was in the movie, Suspension, which was Tanabi stuff, so that stuff's not cheap. I don't even know if they make it for that car anymore. Carbon hood, harnesses, and all the other little bits you're going to looking at probably 35,000 minimum, and that's only if you can find all the parts. Now, speaking candidly, I've seen many of these replicas personally. Most are cosmetically similar, but really aren't accurate. That's not a bad thing. It's just a reminder that you'll have to truly figure out how far you want to go and how far you can afford to go before you undertake such a project. In the end, the Eclipse is and was special to many people because it was representative of the tuner scene at the time. It wasn't the fastest or most exotic tuner car at the time, but it was good looking and it was attainable. That's why it'll always be a fan favorite. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. I hope that information helps you, and keep watching. See you next time. Come, my lady, come, come, my lady. You're my butterfly, sugar.